the NFL, Jed, is um, a curious thing for European sports fans. In Europe, sports teams hate each other and they try and undercut each other. You guys have this kind of weird capitalist socialism going on where everybody shares profits. It's, uh, it's a funny thing for us. It's, it's unique knowing the United States and how our government works versus European governments. And our sports leagues are like the reverse. 100%. So our, our TV revenue is shared equally 100%. Uh, ticket revenue, we share a third of our ticket revenue with the rest of the league. So what we bring in, a third of it goes into a pot and then that gets split 32 ways amongst the other teams. All jersey sales are, are shared equally. So really the only thing that, that a team gets to keep are its own uh, sponsorships, its own club seats and suites, and that's really the only thing that a team gets that they don't share with everybody else. When you talk about um, sponsorships, again, even within sponsorships, the jerseys, I think, like so it's yep. whatever current apparel is, is doing that. What, what are the sponsorships that you can sell around, say, the 49ers, for example? So for us, I mean, obviously the biggest is the naming rights of the stadium, which is Levi's. Um, we've got a lot of founding partners, so whether it's beer, soda, technology partners, um, you know, Verizon is a big partner. So there's, you know, the, the typical categories that you would see in the United States, banking. Yeah. Um, so those are really the big ones that you'll see. And then you'll have a, a, a list of smaller partners. Any NFL fans are going to be familiar with America's Game and uh, the amazing documentary that comes out every year. And in so many of them, Candlestick is a backdrop to fantastic moments. Um, sometimes good, sometimes bad for the 49ers. So leaving there is obviously a wrench. You've got this brilliant, historic, totemic thing, you've got to replace that in the, in the fans' hearts really quickly. And to do that, you need to make an unbelievable experience. How did you go about making sure that Levi's was going to be that experience? So the most important thing for us was building off of what our fan base is. You know, being in the heart of Silicon Valley, using technology, knowing that that's a, a, a fabric of, of our fan base and what they use on a daily basis. We want to make sure that you can take that piece of, of your daily life and transition it into going to a sporting event. So having a stadium that could be ticketless, cashless, you know, being able to watch mobile replays on demand on your phone, um, ordering food to your seat, ordering merchandise to your seat, just making sure that the hassles that go into going to a stadium, we, we reduce the number of hassles that you have. Okay, well that all sounds like a, an ideal solution. You're like, okay, great, I'm gonna do all these things. There's a company out there that I can buy this off. I can just go to a guy and say, here, I'd like this some for my fans. It, it would have made our life simpler. Um, and, you know, that's what happened with Venue Next was, you know, there was no solution out there that was readily available. So we looked and, you know, we talked to JP and we talked to others and we figured if it's not out there to buy, we, we need to build it ourselves. And, and that's where we turned to JP and that's how Venue Next came to be. It's kind of the whole spirit of the Web Summit, I think, where you have a problem and the only solution is to go out there and do it yourself. How did you become involved in this? Where did your background and expertise make you the perfect person to do this thing? Sure. Well, I've been in the high tech industry for 35 years. I uh, have been around Silicon Valley and I'm, I'm also a, a remodeler. So when I heard that we could do something which involved sports, my love, technology, my love, and a new stadium, it was a no-brainer to go do. And, and we also knew from the beginning that everyone that Jed and the team talked to said, if you build it, we'll buy it from you. So from the very beginning, we knew that if we succeeded at Levi's, we could license it to others. Talk to us then about the actual process of, of what it is that you want to build, because the stadium experience for sports fans is so different. Like the NBA experience is completely different from the NFL experience. The NFL experience is completely different from soccer in this part of the world. What's your template? Where do you go looking for stuff and, and what have you built? Sure. So the first thing you have to have is great infrastructure, networking infrastructure. Even here you'll see the Wi-Fi is spotty. Some places it's great. The Wi-Fi is spotty at the Web Summit? Some, generally it's great in this room. We've tried it in this room, but in a few other rooms. So first you have to bring in great infrastructure, uh, whether that's 4G or whether that's Wi-Fi. You have to bring plenty of bandwidth. So. 40 gigabits of bandwidth we bring in and out of the stadium. And then we want to build on top of that. So what we did, right, was we, we looked at integrating all the systems of the stadium. How could we take the pain out of going to a live venue? And really by doing, by integrating with ticketing, 
integrating with security. Like every stadium has a number you can text to. You put something in the subject line, and the security guys will get that. Um, but no one knows that number. No. They're always trying to advertise it. So just integrate with security systems. Integrate with food and beverage so I can order a beer to my seat. Any one of 68,500 people can order, and we'll bring it to you in six and a half minutes. Yeah, the crowd is suddenly perked up. I can get a beer to my seat in the middle of the game within six and a half minutes. Um, and we a... build it around wayfinding, so we put 2,000 beacons throughout the stadium. So we use GPS in the parking lots, beacons inside, so turn-by-turn -turn directions to anywhere in the stadium. I was at the Rugby World Cup final on um, Saturday, and uh, father and son with us both went to the bar at different times, and they both missed a try at a key moment in the game. I think that, you know, you've kind of... That is the fundamental thing, was right. we didn't want to turn everyone into phone watchers, right? That they're there for the game. But we also want to make sure that you can be there for that play. There's yeah. really, there's three reasons people go to a live event in the United States, you know. One, they think their team needs them. Without them, they'll lose. Secondly, they want to be there when Jerry Rice caught that catch. And then third, they want to take their selfie so they can tell all their friends they're there and they're not. Yeah. Uh, and, and all the rest is a hassle. And so how could we use technology to basically cut down the hassle factor? Um, Jeff, this is obviously working. It's working for the, the team. It's, it's making the fans experience of match day exactly what you wanted it to be. And look, that's important in terms of loyalty from the fan base, but also to send the message that you're doing things right, that you're on top of this. Well, that's the key is, you know, we didn't really do this so we can make more money. I mean, it was almost a defensive play because Again, our fans are used to technology, and if their technology doesn't work in a stadium like it does in their local coffee shop or their local pub, it, it makes it harder for them to want to come. And I think I was telling you backstage, you know, at Candlestick, 10% of our parking was fraudulent. Either you know, your buddy was working as the attendant and let you in, or you just printed out a fake pass. So when you have fans that actually bought a parking pass and they get there and there's no space for them, that's, that's not a good thing. We're able to catch that through Venue Next and know that if you didn't pay for a parking pass, you're, you're not going to be in this lot. Yeah. So the people that actually did pay for it, they're, they're there. You know, when you're talking about ordering food to your seat, you don't want to miss that touchdown or goal at the end of the game or whatever sport you're at. You, you want to be there for it. So being able to have things come to you, it just allows you to enjoy your experience of actually watching the game. The whole notion of becoming um, an entrepreneur in something that obviously is, is kind of core to the San Francisco 49ers business, was that, is that also something that you do? Like, are you incubating a load of other companies? Do they all have to be in the sports space? Do they all have to be in the sports stadium space? Or is it only specific to fixing needs, current needs of the team? So Venue Next is definitely the biggest partnership. Um, View Glass is another that we're working on. And so View essentially has tinted glass that allows you to use less energy. Um, it allows your building to be cooler while the sun is out. You know, you don't have to worry about blinds throughout the building. So that's another one that we're working with. There's some other smaller companies that we're working on more on the sports science and sports analytics side. Okay, right, I was gonna ask, because that, that obviously is such a huge growth area. It's good to be ahead of the curve and that kind of stuff. And, and those things, you know, you might not see a return on, on your investment or warrants or things like that that, that we might receive. But anything that can give us a slight advantage in what we're doing to either scout players or keep players healthy, track what they're doing, you know, you, you're always looking for those advantages to give you a chance to beat somebody. And as a matter of interest, do you, do you treat those as separate businesses or do you always kind of think, well, I'm not going to go and buy a, a, a massive company that's already in existence. I'm going to try and develop bespoke stuff in-house. For the most part, we've treated them as separate businesses. And, you know, if, again, if there's a reason for us to partner with entrepreneurs and, and be a bigger piece of it. If, if we see that there's a bigger market opportunity, we would do that like okay. we did with Venue Next. But for the most part, we'd, we'd prefer to let the entrepreneurs you know, run, run what they run and, and let Levi's Stadium or the 49ers be a petri dish for them to test things. Okay, that's kind of the perfect type of investor there. I mean, Jed gave us a beautiful gift. If you think about most of us out in the audience here wants to go start a company, bring a better experience. You're not going to be able to walk into the premier new stadium in the United States uh, and get a chance to do that. Yeah, so no pressure, though. At the same time, you can't screw it up. <laughs> I, I've done a lot of things in my career. It was the hardest uh, right. year because I'm doing it in front of all my neighbors. 
that opening game was that opening game. Yeah. The building was being built. You know, we didn't. The Wi-Fi didn't work three weeks before the first game, right? The, uh, uh, the we couldn't cook food. We were we were practiced delivering food to seats with paper hot dogs and paper beers, because you couldn't get the occupancy permit to cook anything in the stands. So it was uh, a lot of pressure, but it all worked out. It's not like politicians just screw up good things, is it? Yeah. But um, that's the thing. If you're afraid to fail, especially in technology you're not going to be successful. You have to be able to go out, and we had this conversation the first game, there were a lot of people on the ops side that didn't want to do in-seat ordering throughout the entire building. It's like, well, that's, that's what we promised our fans. And if we can't do it in the entire building, I'd rather know now and have it fail now so yeah. we can fix it, as opposed to saying, let's just do it for a few sections and we'll say that it kind of works and then expand it out. Let's, let's do it, and if it doesn't work, we'll figure out why, and we'll fix it. Yeah, it's not a bad um, way of doing things, but so there's pressure when it, when it starts. But then there's also extra pressure when you go, okay, yeah, we are going to host the Super Bowl, and uh, we're going to do it really soon. Was that, a, like, designed to make sure that everybody got their game and, and you know, <laughs> there's a deadline coming, folks? Deadlines help. You know, I mean, deadlines help, whether it was the first game that we did at, at Levi's Stadium, which was a soccer match, um, between the earthquakes and the, the Seattle Sounders or knowing that the Super Bowl is going to have all eyes, especially in America, and a lot of eyes around the world looking at what we're doing. Yeah. I mean, if this is the future of sports and in-venue technology, there's, there's no better place for us to succeed and, you know, failure isn't an option. And have you got more stuff coming out uh, in, in advance of the Super Bowl or is the in-stadium experience now pretty much exactly where you want it to be? Oh, there's, there's things we're going to do in the future. There's something we might do in, just in time for the Super Bowl. Like one, one experience we did this year, which is if you sign in to your Instagram or Facebook or Twitter account and you post a picture to hashtag Levi's Stadium and the 49ers curate it so that it's, we actually welcome you to the stadium. When you walk in one of the gates with beacons, we detect that you're there and yeah. we put a big sign up uh, saying welcome to the leave. It's the only stadium in the world that welcomes its fans with their own picture. That is pretty cool. So You've got some big news for us as well. Yes, yes. We wanted to uh, unveil some news here at Web Summit. So um, what, we're, what we're doing is uh, we're, we're going to announce uh, a partnership with a company called Legends. Um, they're in the hospitality business. They, uh, they sell services to stadiums hospitality services, they do seat builder license of programs for stadiums. But today we're announcing that uh, we're coming to two iconic uh, venues, uh, the, the uh, Yankee Stadium, home of the New York Yankees, uh, and AT&T Stadium, home of the Dallas Cowboys. So two it's, big, iconic brands. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, this means that you've kind of it, it's all well and good doing something in your own stadium. Everybody says, yeah, okay, but it's when other people start trusting you to come into their homes. That's a guarantee that you've been successful. Yeah, yeah. And, and we're already at the Orlando Magic in the NBA. They, they open their season. We're there. But these are two of probably the biggest brands in the United States when yeah, it comes to sports. Two of the sports. biggest brands in world sports, yeah. yeah. See, Jed, this is the whole point. In, in Europe, everybody would be like, yeah, 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 yeah why not? Oh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. In European sport, you'd have Manchester United desperately guarding their secrets from Liverpool and, and, and Arsenal and making sure that they didn't actually have it. So you obviously see the long-term view of being part of a much bigger thing, which is the NFL or Major League Baseball. But, but I think for me, I think it's, it's a lot easier if I'm not running a company. Like, I would much rather an entrepreneur, if we can be helpful, because even, even with a 49er affiliation, it's hard for other teams to want to jump in immediately. Of course. And knowing that... This isn't me, this is Venue Next, it's a separate entity, and you know, we were certainly you know, their, their guinea pig, and you can see how things work, but you do see a lot more collaboration, I think, between professional football teams in the United States, where Jerry Jones was very helpful with us building a new stadium, you know, the Crafts in New England were very helpful, and they know because our model is built off of each team doing well financially, the more you can help somebody else, the better off your team is going to be and the stronger the league will be overall. I guess because you, you actually need your competitors to be strong. Like, do you know or do you have a feeling about which the teams will ultimately end up in LA? 
So, I mean, there's really three teams that are vying for LA. Um, you've got an Inglewood project with the Rams. You've got the Carson project with the Raiders and the Chargers. And, you know, I'm on the stadium committee, so seeing what they're doing, looking at what the host communities are doing. So St. Louis is trying to get something done. The Chargers have tried for a long time to get something done in San Diego. Their government has not been very helpful. The Raiders are, are in a tough situation in Oakland. Oakland hasn't been very helpful in trying to get the Raiders a new stadium. So it's, it's going to come down to the wire of what's the best project and, and what teams actually fit the relocation guidelines and you know, deserve to move to really the second largest market in, in the country. Yeah, because uh, there's going to be, whoever it is, it's going to be a huge thing for them. Just in, in terms of that, yeah, I think there was uh, some visionary politicians about 15 years ago who looked at the 49ers and thought, we could get these guys out here if we, you know, if we did a deal with them. And, and that seems to be an arrangement that's worked quite well. From the outside anyway, I don't know if that's your experience. So, I mean, for us, there was a big private par public partnership between Santa Clara and the 49ers. We tried to get something done in San Francisco since 1997. Um, it just never came to fruition. So we said, all right, if we can't stay in the city, we want to make sure that we stay in our, our fan base. And, and you know, the majority of our fans live in the South Bay, so along the peninsula. So we built much closer where our existing fan base is. So we want to make sure that if we can't be in the city, we want to be in our region. And that was very important to us. So the money that went into our building, it was no public impact to taxpayers or the city's general fund. And it was all revenues publicly driven that were there because the stadium was there, not because we were taking money from existing programs, et cetera. Yeah. So we had, to, we had to work very hard. I mean, it was a very complex deal to put together, but it's something that I think works and allows us to, to be good partners with the city of Santa Clara. Yeah, and it's clearly working in terms of the stadium. I guess it would be much easier for you guys to talk about this stuff if the team was just doing a little bit better at the moment. Yeah, I mean, two and six isn't where we want to be, but we have a good core group of talent. We're going to work, we're going to get better. We've always believed in building through the draft and supplementing through free agency, and you know we'll we'll keep working. People didn't think we can win before. We went to three NFC Championship games. We'll we'll get back there again. Does it have an impact on beer sales when uh, things are going well? Do, do people actually buy a few more beers when the team is losing by the, 20 points? The only thing that that really changes is merchandise. So you'll see there's always a big spike at the end of a win in merchandise sales. Right. Everything else is fairly even throughout the game. The, the big thing is that, you know, extra $50,000, $100,000 of merchandise sales at the end of the game. Okay, that's interesting. You do have an awful lot of data then, obviously, with all this stuff coming through as well. And we obviously talked about the, the sports analytics side of things, but consumer analytics is also uh, a huge thing in the match day experience too. We didn't really talk about that back end of things, but I presume that's there as well. Oh, yes, yes, very much. We've instrumented all of those back end systems. We integrated, we instrument what the fan does. So as an example, the 49ers knew about 19,000 season ticket holders. That was their customer base. Now after the first season, they now know about 204,000 people who actually came to the venue by getting people's tickets on their phones. You actually know that you went to the game versus you handing an anonymous paper ticket to someone else. Yeah. So they know a lot more about their fan base. They can market to their fan base more effectively. That's really the value we bring. Besides helping to improve revenues and decrease costs. Yeah, in a way that allows, that always allows you to communicate directly to them. And I think this is going to become more important as sports organizations maybe circumvent the media in certain, in certain instances, in, for good and bad, I guess, in some ways. But it allows to, to kind of get your message out whenever you need to get it out. Yes. That's right. Is that important from an ownership perspective as well? It, I mean, it's very important to me because I see 70,000 people go to Levi's Stadium but it's 70,000 unique individual experiences that happen to collectively come together in one venue. So for me, if I'm gonna bring my family, it's a much different experience than somebody going with a bunch of buddies or you know, going on a date, whatever it is, and you want everybody to have their own unique individual experience and get the most out of what they want, not, not what the team gives to you, but what you bring to the stadium and to the team. Yeah. And that can be an ever-changing thing that you, you guys learn from as well. Absolutely. All right, well, listen, it's, a, it's a, an absolutely amazing success story. Best of luck with the Super Thank Bowl you. and with your new clients as well. Ladies and gentlemen, John Paul and Jeb York. Thank you. Thank you.